Hey, we're wrapping up our series, The Renewal of All Things, and I promised you it would end. And I hope that from it, uh, you've been given a new impression, a fuller understanding of the hope that we have for the future as followers of Jesus, uh, that we have a promise-keeping God who's made all kinds of amazing promises to us. And my concern for the series that, is that I might lose some of you because this is so content-heavy and seemingly light on everyday application. So I hope that's not true because I think this is highly applicable to our daily lives. And so I kind of want to wrap it up by making it as applicable as we can make it this morning. So if you haven't been here, you'll figure it out in a minute. You, you, you'll know what we're talking about. But if we truly believe in, in a life beyond this life, then it should affect the life we live now, right? It should encourage us, at the very least, in our daily living and give us a foundation which we can make a difference for the kingdom here and now. And so I'm going to wrap up our series this week in the hopes that we can bring the last five weeks uh, to head and that maybe this will sink into our everyday living. And I want to just make sure that we value the treasure of hope. That the pain in the world, you know, the pain that the world is facing right now, isn't because people have too much hope because they have too little hope. And so, uh, and in fact, the constant kind of push in American Christianity is to make everything practical. And that kind of betrays us and exposes how utterly fixated we are on the present moment. And of course, yes, we need to embody God's love in the world today. That goes without question. The human race is not well. Things fall apart. We must care for the planet and all creation. We must fight injustice. But, but we kind of speak of that sometimes so casually that we don't understand how demanding that work really is. It's heartbreaking work. You know, for those who serve in positions where it just seems like they're keeping pieces together and helping broken people all the time, you know, that those who serve like on the front lines of those kind of things, that it's, a, it's a very high burnout rate. And so without a glorious hope for the future blazing in our hearts, we'll be crushed by the pain of this world. That's why C.S. Lewis could say, if, this is his quote, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought the most about the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they've become so ineffective in this one. And so if you want to make a big difference in the world, the best thing you can do is exactly what the scriptures command us to do, and that's grab the promised renewal with both hands and make it the anchor of your soul. In fact, if you want to look in your outline there, Hebrews 6, 18, 19, the writer of Hebrews says, we who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to what? Grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go. It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline reaching past all appearances right to the very presence of God. And so, you know, people want to know, how is God going to make it all right? How is he going to redeem, you know, all the suffering in the world and in my own life? The answer has never been, you know, through this new Bible study, through this new church, through this new worship experience. I mean, if 2,000 years since Christ ascended into the heavens hasn't taught us anything, the answer has always been Jesus Christ will redeem all of it at the renewal of all things when he returns again. Theologian Gary Black observed, the Bible speaks of now and forever as a continuation of a single existence. Consequently, much of the transcendent purpose God has for human life can only be understood and discerned in light of eternity. Unfortunately, for an ever-increasing number of us who suffer through the pain and disillusionment of dysfunctional relationships in our families and marriages, of political and social injustice, of physical and emotional abuse, and of mental or psychological disorientation, our lives simply do not and will not make sense without eternity as a backdrop on which God can manifest his endless love, redemptive power, and enabling grace. Such a perspective alone has the potential to revolutionize the universe. 
I mean, if you woke each morning and your heart leapt with hope, knowing that the renewal of all things was just around the corner, might even come today, you would be one happy person. I mean, if you knew in every fiber of your being that nothing is lost, that everything will be restored to you and then some, you would be armored against discouragement and despair. If your heart's imagination were filled with rich expectations of all the goodness coming to you, your confidence would be contagious, you would be unstoppable. And so friends, don't let anyone or anything cheat you out of this hope. It's your spiritual lifeline. Don't, don't let anything diminish the beauty and the power and the significance of this hope above all hopes. Jesus lived the way he did in this world for this world because his, set, his hope was set beyond this world. That's the secret of his life. Look at Hebrews 12 too. Study how he did it, speaking of Jesus, because he never lost sight of where he was headed that exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way. The cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. And so yes, we need to make this practical. We need to take this hope so seriously that we sell everything to buy the field. You know, we, do, we, just, we, we must make this utterly real and tangible so that over time, our souls are truly anchored by that hope. So here's a good place to start. What are the first three things you plan to do when you enter the kingdom? What are the first three things you do, you plan to do when you enter the future kingdom? That's a serious question, though I'm not asking for you to raise your hand and tell me, though someone at the early service did. That was interesting. It was a good answer. So, but, you know, we should begin making an eternal bucket list that puts to shame anything we could come up with in this life. So allow yourself to dream big. I mean, for the simple reason that if this is not something you're making plans for, then your hope's not really set there. So what are the first three things you plan to do? Where are the first three places you would want to visit? I mean, is there some special spot that you haven't seen maybe since childhood that you would love to return to? I mean, we didn't have central air in our house growing up in Michigan as a child, but, you know, with the windows open and we had an attic fan. Anyone ever have an attic fan and just sucks the air in, you know? It was cool at night and I just slept like a baby. I, I, I wouldn't mind experiencing that, like, in my own old home again. And then like the smell of Sunday morning newspaper and fresh coffee when I woke up as a young child to find my dad at the table. How reassuring that was to me. See, this isn't wishful thinking. Either you believe the kingdom is coming or you don't. And, And if you do believe, now you understand that the kingdom means the restoration of all things. Remember, we've been studying this in Revelation. Look, I am making everything new, Jesus said. And so given like the suffocating pathological unbelief of our post-Christian culture, you're going to have to make very conscious choices to take hold of this hope. Like, like this attitude of, well, the renewal of all things might be true. That's not grabbing hold. Or, you know, like acceptance, okay, I think it might, you know, I think it is, is not taking hold. We need to grab this hope like we would, you know, hug the person in front of us if we were passengers on a wild motorcycle ride. We need to take hold like, like you might on the top of a ladder when you suddenly think you might have lost your balance. I mean, seize is a far better word. We have to seize this hope. So it might help again. We asked this in week number one, but let's return to it. How is your hope these days? How is your hope these days? And where is your hope these days? You know, what have you put your hope in? Because to shepherd your first hope for the treasure it is, you need to be aware of what you're currently doing with your hope right now. Have, have you attached previous, uh, I mean, have you attached precious hopes to, to casual things? You know, you, to just about anything? 
How many of you ever looked forward to something with great anticipation and then it like fell flat? Anybody? I think all of us have at one time, right? I'm sure we all have stories where we just hoped in something in this life that just didn't bring us the joy we expected it to or planned on it, you know, to do. And so sometimes that comes in relationships or sometimes maybe something less important like, like a family vacation. And, you know, as a kid, um, our family often took family vacations to, to different destinations. And one year we had booked a, a spring break trip uh, to Florida. I was probably in fourth grade. I was super thrilled because it was just going to be me, me and my parents because I didn't really like my sister. And so that was fun. And so we had Disney planned and some spring training baseball games and a day or two at the coast. And so we took the long drive from Michigan to Florida, which is, you know, long enough right there. And we pulled into the condo and we were, and, you know, we were excited. We got our things unpacked, we got our groceries, we sat down at the table just to kind of make sure we had our plans for the week when all of a sudden my dad looked really pale. He wasn't feeling well. And by morning he had full-blown flu symptoms that knocked him out and about a day later uh, my mom got sick and guess what? I wasn't too far behind either. So we spent the entire trip in the condo. Yeah, my hopes were in that trip as a fourth grader, I gotta tell you, okay? And they were definitely disappointed. See, we often pin our greatest hopes on the next trip, the next weekend, the next concert, the next iPhone, you know, the next game, the next or current relationship, the next purchase, if our hearts, as, as if our hearts really need those things. And, and some things, you know, those are great things. There's nothing wrong with any of those. But they can never fulfill us fully as we seem to think they will. 1 Peter 1.13, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. And so our hope is best set fully on his return. Most of the times, my hopes aren't even partially set on his return. I mean, not in all practicality, not in day-to-day -day living. I believe in the kingdom, I believe everything I'm saying, but I, I, I often keep giving my heart to things like I've described and I keep putting my ultimate hopes in places they shouldn't be. I mean, I love to travel. Haven't done a lot of it since we've had children. Um, and so, you know, this last year, after COVID started calming down for a little bit there, we got some cheap flights. Jennifer and I, it was the first time we were going to travel since 2004 without our kids for a weekend, you know, more than a weekend. And so we were really excited. So we planned this trip to, to Northern California. And the reason we picked Northern California is Jennifer had always wanted to see the Redwoods because her, her grandfather kind of put that dream in her when she was younger because he always talked about wanting to go himself. And then when she was a little girl, you know, they said, well, you know, we need to do that someday. And, you know, we really need to do that someday. And of course, you know, we say that sometimes it just doesn't really happen, and so it didn't happen, and so I wanted to make that dream real for Jennifer, and so, you know, we, we saw the Redwoods. It was phenomenal. It was one of the best trips I've ever taken. We, we saw things we had talked about seeing for years, and it was actually, and like I said, a, a dream her grandfather had put into her, and so when we got there, you know, we marveled at them, we took photos, and I heard the story again that she told me about her granddad, and as much as we enjoyed the things we saw, the best part of the trip was spending time with her, not the destination. Spending time with her, like without like distractions that you get in everyday life. So her granddad's, her granddad hadn't seen the redwoods. It was a dream of his. But if what we're talking about is true, he will see them at the restoration of all things. I mean, I'd love to travel, but I'd rather spend time with the people I love. I'll get to see those sights at the Great Restoration. And I'm not knocking traveling the world. I mean, you give me a ticket, I'll go. But uh, if I can't now, I will later. And we act so often as if we won't be able to, to see them. And so we create bucket lists and spend money, on, uh, spend money to do things as if we'll never get the chance to do them if they aren't done immediately. And that wasn't the perspective of Jesus and his very close friends down through the centuries. It, it is meant to be our daily perspective as opposed to all those, you know, 50 places you need to fish, surf, golf, dine at sea before you die book. So another way to begin to seize this hope with a good, firm grasp is to ask yourself, what have I done with my kingdom heart? Where am I currently taking it? 
because you know, we all have a heart for joy. Where is your hope for joy set right now? You have a heart for redemption. Where are you taking your heart for redemption these days? You, you ache for restoration, yours and those you love. Where is your hope for restoration these days? And what I'm suggesting is that we need to begin to make conscious, deliberate decisions to give our hearts to the return of Jesus and the renewal of all things. That every time you find yourself getting anxious about an uncertain hope, stop and pray, Jesus, I give my hope to your true and certain return and the renewal of all things. Every time disappointment strikes again, you pray, Jesus, I give my heart to your kingdom. I am made for your kingdom and nothing else will do. When you wake in the morning and all your hopes and fears, you know, rush at you. When you come home at night, beat up from another long day and all you want to do is self-medicate. When you hear of someone else's great joy and something envious rises in you, make the conscious decision to give your heart to the return of Christ and the restoration of all things. And especially when you experience loss. I mean, friends, we, we, we remember that life is a long series of goodbyes. You have suffered so many losses already. We, we hate to admit it, but many more are yet to come. But now we can say to ourselves, nothing is truly lost. This is going to come back to me. It's as simple as this. If you do not give your heart over to the renewal of all things, you will take your kingdom heart to something in this world. You'll do compulsive things. You'll be tempted to do far darker things. It's inevitable. But if you begin to choose the kingdom, you know, seek ye first, if you consciously and deliberately give your heart to the renewal of all things, you'll notice the effects immediately. So much pressure will be lifted off your current hopes. When things don't go well, you'll find yourself less angry, less dejected. As your heart and soul become anchored in the renewal, you'll find yourself freer to risk especially love. You can love people because God will do everything in his power to make sure you don't lose them because the goodbyes of his children are only momentary. You can love beautiful places and cultures and things because even though it looks like they may be vanishing, they will be restored. For nothing is lost. Nothing is lost. He renews all things. Do you believe it? And I've known these things for a long time, but I, I didn't live like I knew them to be true. I mean, sometime in the last two years, a switch came on as I found myself living, along with the rest of you, kind of in a new reality. And, and a lot of things that, that maybe we've taken for granted are different now. I also turned 50 during that time and beginning to uh, feel some of the effects of aging. So I've had to fill my mind with new dreams, you know, when I was younger, you know, I dreamt of what life would be like, you know, as a pastor and a husband and a father, etc. And some of my dreams came true and some of them not so true. But so now my dreams are about where my life is headed in the last third of my life. They aren't things I thought about in my 20s. And so the sunrise out my window has become a regular reminder for me every morning. You know, I see the, the restoration more readily in nature, in photos, in people, in books, and in movies. They're so plentiful, but I think I missed most of them before, or at least I didn't pay attention to them. I mean, one example, it's a silly example, but maybe the younger people can identify with it because I don't normally watch these kind of movies, but I mean, they're so good. There's so many children's movies that are just filled with these hopes. I mean, think about the movie Tangled. Most of you seen the movie Tangled? Okay, at least a few of you. Disney story of a princess stolen from an, by an evil woman and held captive for decades. Every year, her father and mother, the king and the queen, you know, they release lanterns into the sky to commemorate her birthday and to proclaim, you know, this hope that she will return one day. And far off, you know, in her prison tower, the captive princess sees those lanterns and something in her heart knows that they're for her. And finally, she breaks free of the witch and she makes it back to the city in time to see those lanterns for herself. I mean, it mirrors the day we get to come home to our father king and the reception he will have for us. 
See, you'll be greatly helped by filling your imagination with the images of the coming renewal. Without them, it will be impossible to make this the anchor of your soul. If you would take hold of this hope with both hands and never let go, you need to know what it is you're taking hold of. I mean, most of you remember that song from 20, 25 years ago. I think it's that long now. I can only imagine Mercy Me wrote about heaven. That's just the problem. When we say to ourselves, I can only imagine, what we really mean is, I can't imagine. And since you can't imagine it, you can't hope for it. And the foggy and the vague do not inspire. So ask Jesus to show you his kingdom. Ask Jesus to show you his kingdom. Like sanctify your imagination and all your spiritual gifts back to him and ask him to reveal to you pictures of the coming kingdom. I mean, be specific. If you want to see the city, ask to see the city. If you want to see those waterfalls, ask to see them. You will need to be open to being surprised. Do not script what you think you should see. I mean, I would love to see again the the waters in Tortuga off the side of a fishing boat that can only be described as old as Jesus. It was that old, it seemed. And uh, to see the aquamarine ocean clear as glass with marine life below us, keeping pace with us. I want to see that again, but this time without the seasickness. Some of you were on that trip with me and remembered all too well how unpleasant it was. See, it's reimagining the beauty I've seen or been told about that shatters my lingering religious fears that heaven is going to be boring because it isn't going to be boring. Stay open to surprises. Keep asking for glimpses of the kingdom any way God wants to bring them. This is how we reach into the future to take hold of the hope that is our anchor. The more our imaginations seize upon the reality, the more we'll have confident expectation of all the goodness coming to us. Because we've been looking for the kingdom all our lives. When we were children, you know, we searched for it in ponds and cornfields and attics and bedroom forts we make with blankets. We found it in fairy tales and our favorite stories. We, we, all our lives we've been looking for it. In fact, that's why you'll, you'll hear a certain song or piece of music and it brings you to tears because it's haunting you with the kingdom for some reason. That all your special places or those you dream of going, the longing you have for them is not because the kingdom is there, but rather because it's calling to you through that place and the aromas and the way you feel when you're there. God knew he had to woo our hearts forward into the restoration and so he wove the promise of it onto the earth. And now you understand why that promise fits perfectly with a wild hope deep within our hearts, a hope we hardly dare to name. That as we live forward from here, we can now interpret the promise rightly and we can embrace it for we know what it is. That the renewal of all things is the most beautiful, hopeful, glorious promise ever made in any story, religion, philosophy, or fairy tale, and it is real. And it's yours. It's real and it's yours. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Making sure you all are awake because maybe you don't. Because as you begin to see for yourself, you will find hoping in it rather easy. As you place your hopes in it, you'll be the most grounded person you know. So allow me, before we close, to turn our hearts there one last time. What are the first three things you plan to do at the renewal of all things? And I'll share mine if that helps you to begin to name yours. Though some people shared afterwards with me at the other service, they had a great list too. So first for me, I'm going to run and jump into the arms of Jesus. We'll finally be with Jesus, and he and I will throw our heads back and laugh. The laughter of good friends reunited, the laughter of victors who have overcome. We will savor the laughter of kindred spirits who share in the greatest of all triumphs that it was all true that life can now begin. And then I'm going to go to the feast to search for those I've loved and have loved me but have lost. You know, though I'm sure I won't have to look very far, I know in his kindness, our host will have seated us at tables close together. And so, you know, I hope before that celebration's over, I I hope to play poker with my grandma who taught me how to play. 
and I'll walk around the block of my first home with my other grandma who watched me as a child, and I'll have a competitive Easter egg hunt with my sister Brenda, which is a long story. I'll meet my grandfathers for the first time, hopefully. I'll swap jokes with my mother, who was the worst joke teller. And I'll see so many of you. Hopefully all of you. I'll again get the toughest handshake from Harold Stevens. Howard Montague will tell me another story about Happy Chandler. Ray Duncan will get all the guys together for another softball game. And then before the night's over, the praise band will reunite with T. Jones and sing his favorite songs. And then I'll welcome my own children back from having to say goodbye to me in this life. And so we'll all laugh, surprised at how much more wonderful it all is than we dreamed. And yet how very like we thought it might be too. And afterward, after that long and glorious celebration where every story is told rightly and rewards are lavishly given, you know, before we're set to work again, I'm going to get whoever wants to come along, hoping, hopefully my family at least, and maybe close friends, and we'll just explore all the world has to offer that we haven't seen or want to share with each other. All of creation will be ours again, and like children, we'll play again. Perhaps in our adventures, we'll come to a lake where we can sit quietly and dangle our feet over the edge, watching the fireflies come in at dusk, relishing the freshness of all things made new. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we continue to seek your help. We so often put our hope in things of this world when it can only be placed in your son Jesus, who didn't just die and rise again so we'd have, you know, forgiveness of sin and get out of hell free card, but they bring, they intended to bring us an abundant life in the here and now, lives we can begin to enjoy now, not just in the future, but there's so much pain and heartbreak in the world that we face that we can't do it alone, and we can't do it without a future hope of what the renewal of all things will look like. So would your spirit work in us this week, this month, for the rest of our lives to help us to see glimpses of your kingdom in such a way that it brings us encouragement and hope, and we'd put away all those other hopes that are less than what you have for us away. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.